Mình ra đó Hello and welcome to Theology on Tap. A lot of times we as pastors or preachers, we tend to take a verse out of context in order to support our theology. Many years ago, I read a book called Purpose Driven Life. Great book uh, by a great pastor and uh, millions of people uh, read the book. But the problem that I had with the book was that any time that he wanted to make a point, that he would take one verse from scripture and to support his idea that he had for a purpose-driven life. And a lot of times he would take a, a, a NIV or sometimes King James Version, other times Living Bible, and he would take the, the, the version that would fit or make sense to what he was trying to say. Now I take an issue with that because sometimes it really seemed like he was taking a verse out of context in the, in the scripture to support his idea. I don't think it should be done that way. So, so today what I want to do is I want to use a, um, a more recent book. It was written by Francis Chan and it's called Multiply. And I'm using this book just because I happen to have it. And I want to use this book to point out at least in one place where we tend to take a verse out of context to support our theology. And I take an issue with this book from the very beginning. By the way, Francis Chan is a great guy. I have nothing against him or anything like that at all. I'm just using his book as an example. Now, from the very beginning, I believe the premises of this book is that, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And I want to read to you from page 18. He said, basically, Jesus says that we need to repent, which I agree with that. But Rome, he uses Romans chapter 3, verse 23 as an example. He says, this verse explains that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, when we study Romans chapter 3, verse 22, within the context, what the writer is talking about is that we have Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, and he did it for everyone, not just for people who believe or not believe, religious or not, he did it for everyone. That means the righteousness of God is something that we have because of what we, He has done. So I believe the reason why we evangelize is to let them know the truth that what Christ has done. So with that, knowing that they have the righteousness of God, they could start living their life for God. So if they have the righteousness, they have the ability to live that life that glorifies God. But the way that the most Christians use from the very beginning is just to say, hey, listen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, he doesn't really talk about the verse before, verse 22. He skips that and goes straight into verse 23 and just say, hey, look what the Bible says. Everybody's a sinner. Right? And that's not what verse 22 says. So, a lot of times I wonder why is it that we tend to use verse 23 without explaining verse 21 and verse 22. And I think that's a big issue. Because if you skip those verses and go straight to verse 23, we could make the argument that everybody is a sinner. Everybody has sinned. But when we think about verse 22, that's not what it said. And I went, made two videos to emphasize on that. So what, what this book and many other Christians are saying is that you got to have faith in Jesus Christ in order to receive the salvation to live our life for God. We need to have that. And, and instead of saying what Christ has done, His faith has already given us the righteousness of God. Already given us so that we could live our life for God. So when you use chapter 3 verse 23 without explaining verse 22, you lose the whole meaning of Romans chapter 3. I have another point to make, but before we do, I just want to point out the fact that it's um, a couple days ago, there was a mass shooting in Orlando, and a lot of people are hurting. There are a lot of people these days crying out because of pain and the sufferings maybe, or people feel that life is unfair. The election is coming in the United States of America and there's two sides that are fighting against each other, which made people, two sides, 
fighting against each other as well. It kind of reminds me of, in the Old Testament days, you know, God has given His people, the, the Jewish, His nation, the Word of God. And within that Word of God, there was a prophecy about the Messiah that is to come. And a lot of them read it, expected Jesus to come. And it's surprising that a lot of Jews today, they do not know the book of Isaiah as, as much as they should. It's kind of forgotten chapter, uh, book. Uh, they don't emphasize it as much. But back then, 2,000 years ago, they actually did. They read it. They were expecting the Messiah because they knew it, that he was going to come soon. But the prophecy was that they would reject the Messiah. Now, why would they do that? Why? I believe one big main reason is because that they felt that they were the chosen people of God and everybody else were not. So they would call themselves the Jews and everyone else were called the Gentiles. And there was a, a wall of separation, the chosen one of God and the one that was not chosen. And when, when the Bible talks about, in the New Testament, the wall of separation, within the temple of God, it, I was taught that it was a literal wall that the Gentiles were not able to come across. There was a division. So, I'm sure a lot of people were, you know, left out, maybe. And the people that was, were within the wall basically felt that they were special. So when Jesus Christ came and he was going about preaching, there is a, a chapter in the book of Luke, chapter 4. It talks about how Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth to give a, a, a sermon. He did a marvelous job. He read the book of Isaiah, talking about the Messiah that is to come. At the end of the reading of scripture, he folded up this of the text and and he looked at the crowd and he said in today the prophecy is fulfilled in me I mean that's what he said so basically what Jesus told his hometown brothers was that he was the Messiah that they don't have to wait for a savior anymore because he was the one now how do you think that people in his hometown reacted the people there actually welcomed Jesus as the Messiah they liked it what I, I imagine, basically, is that people heard Jesus reading the book of Isaiah, which is just filled with hope, good news, great news of God. And they were waiting for someone like him. So when Jesus said, I am the Messiah, everybody clapped. Everybody welcomed him. And it was a great scene. I wish, I, I mean, when I picture it in my mind, I see it as, I mean, I would have given a standing ovation, finally. The Messiah has come. But then why did they reject him? When at first they welcomed him. Well, here's, here's the thing. Now the prophecy from the Old Testament was that the salvation was not going to be just for the Jews, but as it's going to be for the Gentiles as well. But remember the walls of hostility. There were division. People weren't really getting along. So Jesus Christ, when, when people welcomed him as the Messiah, the first thing he said is, hey, you know, my own people will reject me, but the Gentiles, the Gentiles will accept me. And they, I mean, the prophecy from the book of Isaiah was that he will be the king of Jews and Gentiles. But the people that listened to him, who just clapped and was so enthused that Messiah has finally come for them, Man, they were upset, so upset the Messiah was for the Gentiles. So immediately they tried to throw him off the cliff and try to murder Jesus Christ. And I believe that was the very beginning of the plots that they were making to get rid of Jesus. That's when they rejected him. The reason why I take issue with today's Christianity sometimes is that I feel like we're pretty much the same because we change the Word of God, the New Testament, to fit our theology. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. 
So we automatically think that everybody is going to go to hell. But when you read verse 22 and 23, you realize that's not what he meant. Not at all. So why is it that we as, as Christians want to say, hey, you could have salvation, but only if you join us. Why do we build a wall of hostility? And why is it that we, we change the words in Scripture in order to support that theology? Theology of separation. I believe because of the wall of hostility that we have built to separate those of us who have salvation and that us that do not. Because we call ourselves Christians because we have faith in Jesus. But those who do not, we say you're outside of salvation, so there is a wall. So as I'm making this video, I'm making it with a heavy heart. There are so many people who are in the need of salvation. And because they feel that they're outside of the wall, they have placed their hope on something totally different. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we gotta go out there and tell the truth. We gotta knock down that wall of hostility so they could look within themselves and find God, to find Christ. And within that comfort that they would follow God because only God, only Jesus could carry the burdens, the difficulties of life, the annoyance of things that's going on in the world. Only Christ could carry that for us. And, and the reason why I believe in that is not just because the Bible says so, because there are so many others who have placed their hope on others, other people, other things, government and all that, and they're not getting it. And sometimes when we rely on other people, it just gets worse. That's why the Bible is clear. It says if you want to save your life, you will lose it. But if you were to deny yourself and lose your life for the sake of Christ, you will find life. And I'm a firm believer of that. And everybody has that within themselves. You don't have to go to anybody and say, I repent of my sins. And here's my another point. Why is it that we as, as Christians, we use Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We use it all the time. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we don't share verse 22. But you know what else? We don't share verse 24 either. By the way, for those of us who are Christians, who have been to church all our lives, we may have heard, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, let me ask you, what comes next? What does verse 24 say? And I'll read it, verse 23 and 24 together. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified, or in a better term, have been made righteous, okay? are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Did you know that? Now, in a lot of the books, you know what they do? Is that they use Romans chapter 3, verse 23 at the beginning of the book. And then at the end of the book, after they make their point about what we need to do for the church and for God or whatever it may be, they use verse 24. For those of you who are burdened in life, who feel that life is unfair, for those of you who are filled with anxieties, just worrying all the time about the future because of what the government and the scientists, they warn us all the time of all the incoming danger, Christians telling you that Jesus is coming back this year, there's going to be pain and suffering and all that kind of stuff, so everybody's just worried. For those of you who are poor, for those of you who feel that you're just nothing, just sinner, depraved in life, because somebody's judged you that way, Christ is for you. Christ is not for those who feel that they're saved already and they feel they're safe. Christ is for you. And you know what he said? He said, everyone, 
whether you feel like you're saved or not, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And you are now justified. You're now justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Christ. Right? I hope you find comfort in that. You have the righteousness of God within you. Look within your heart and mind. You know that it's true. Right? And you will find life. You will find peace. You will find grace. You will find hope. And you will find love. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this one. And I got a lot more videos to come. There's so many things in Scripture that I want to point out to you. Um, I hope this was a good one for you. Find peace in Christ. And um, um, join me next time. God bless you.